Okay, good morning. It's uh, good to see you this morning. It's good to be together. Um, my wife, Amber, is currently in very sunny and very hot Southern California. Um, those of you who know Amber will know that that's where she's originally from. She's lived in this country for, oh gosh, I don't know, 18 years now, I think. But um, uh, there's an a International Calvary Chapel Pastors Wives Conference taking place. Um, and it's actually been hosted at her original home church in Calvary Chapel Corona over in Southern California. So uh, Amber has uh, gone over for one week uh, along with uh, Debbie Arnold from Calvary Chapel Bristol. Uh, to attend the conference, uh, which is uh, taking place Monday through Wednesday of next week. So please do pray uh, for me. <laughs> I certainly need your prayers um, with our four children. I think the children probably need your prayers more than I do. Uh, but uh, um, please do remember Amber in your prayers as well. She's back next Friday. And uh, we'll be with us, uh, of course, next Sunday. Okay, um, if you have your Bible, please open with me to the book of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Now, we began to look at this chapter right in the middle of the book of Revelation last week. Uh, and it's a quite fascinating, quite incredible chapter in the book of Revelation uh, because it gives us a glimpse behind the scenes of the events that are taking place on earth, a glimpse into the spiritual realm and the spiritual battle that lies behind the events that are taking place on earth. Now, chapter 12 primarily directs our attention toward the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation, which will come upon this earth immediately prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, but the first uh, six verses that we looked at last week uh, drew our attention to the bigger picture in order to lay the context for what is about to follow. Now, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, and I think we can put the verses up on the, uh, or can we? Yes, there we are. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of his age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This verse in Ephesians chapter 6 uh, reminds us, teaches us, that behind the physical reality that we see and experience, there is a spiritual reality and a spiritual battle. God is at work in this world, working out his purposes uh, in and through his people, and Satan is also at work in this world, opposing God's purposes and opposing God's people. Uh, and we saw this uh, in Revelation chapter 12 and the first six verses last week, as John had a vision of two great signs in heaven. The first sign in Revelation 12 and verse 1 was the, a woman, uh, a woman who was experiencing great labor pains, and she was ready to give birth to a male child. And we noted last week uh, that according to verse 4, the male child that was to be born uh, is the one who would rule the nations with a rod of iron, uh, and one who would be caught up to the throne of God. And that um, clearly identifies this male child uh, as the Messiah, as Jesus. Uh, and so we then identified this woman as symbolic of the nation of Israel. The sun, the moon, and the stars there in chapter 12 and verse 1 uh, are a reference to the dream of Joseph back in Genesis chapter 37 and is a reference to uh, Israel. 
And the Messiah did indeed come into this world through the nation of Israel by God's will and purpose. Uh, But in addition to the woman representing Israel and the male child representing the Messiah, in verse 3, John saw another sign, a great dragon. Now down in verse 9 of chapter 12, that dragon is identified very clearly as Satan. And he is described for us as having seven heads and ten horns, which we said last week uh, speaks generally of his power and authority over the kingdoms of this earth. Indeed, Jesus referred to Satan as the ruler of this earth. Paul in Corinthians referred to him as the God of this age. In 1 John, we're told that the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Uh, And so we have the woman who is Israel, we have the dragon who is Satan. And then in verse 4, We read that the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. Why? In order to devour her child as soon as it was born. Uh, And so the picture there being very clear. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place behind all the events that we see taking place in this world. This spiritual battle has existed since the fall of Satan in heaven and since the fall of man on earth recorded in the book of Genesis. And God's purpose in this world ultimately is to bring forth the Messiah through the nation of Israel to bring salvation to this world. And then we see Satan's efforts in trying to stop that from happening. And last week we traced this spiritual battle throughout biblical history. Uh, Following Satan's deceiving of Eve in the garden... Uh, And the fall of man, in Genesis 3, verse 15, uh, God told Satan that there would be a child born of the woman who would not only bring salvation into this world, would would overcome and would destroy Satan himself. Uh, And as we go through the narrative of Scripture, we see the promise of that child was given then to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, to Abraham's son Isaac, to Isaac's son Jacob, to Jacob's son Judah. And then we follow the line all the way down to King David uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 in particular. uh, All the way through to the birth of the Messiah, which is obviously recorded for us in the beginning of the Gospels. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, was brought forth through the nation of Israel. But we also saw last time how every step of the way, Satan has sought to destroy that seed, to prevent the Messiah from coming forth. Uh, Whether it was through Cain, who murdered Abel, the seed of the woman, but the Lord raised up another seed, uh, the line of Seth. Uh, Whether it was Esau, uh, who was so mad with Jacob that Jacob uh, took his uh, blessing, that he sought to kill Jacob, uh, but that attempt was thwarted and the seed was preserved. Whether it was Pharaoh uh, in the book of Exodus who sought to kill uh, all uh, the firstborn children of the nation of Israel, Uh, but yet that effort was thwarted as the Hebrew midwives refused to comply and God preserved the line ultimately raising up Moses to deliver the people from Uh, Egypt. Uh, We go on through the lines to see Saul uh, trying to kill David, who was in the promised line. We see Haman in the book of Esther trying to wipe out the entire Jewish race in order to destroy the line. Uh, and, and, And the thing is, throughout all of these things is Satan working behind the scenes. Uh, in order to try and thwart and overcome the purposes of God. Of course, Satan failed. Uh, To do that, the Messiah was born. He had another attempt with King Herod, who tried to murder all uh, the the boys that were born. Uh, That failed, and so Jesus, the Messiah, came. He lived. Uh, He died for the sins of the world. He rose again, conquering sin and death, and ascended into heaven. So you might think, well, surely Satan's done. That's it. Uh, Satan's going to give up and go home. Uh, But we see that that is not the case. And that is because while uh, Jesus uh, did indeed conquer sin and death through his death and resurrection, uh, Satan found himself still alive, as it were. Uh, And yet, 
uh, the promise of a coming kingdom in which Christ would rule and reign on this earth hadn't yet come. And so Satan turns his attention from trying to stop Jesus being born at his first coming to try and prevent him from coming at his second coming. And this is why the nation of Israel is still significant today. Because just as the Messiah was brought forth through the nation of Israel at his first coming, so too the Messiah will come back to the nation of Israel at his second coming. In fact, Jesus said that he will not return until the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus will return uh, to the nation of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem, in order that he might sit on the throne of David and rule and reign the nations from the city of Jerusalem, from the nation of Israel. And as such, Satan is thinking, well, if that's all supposed to be happening, then I am going to try and destroy the Jewish people. Because if there's no Jewish people, if there's no nation of Israel, then there's no nation for Jesus to come back to and God's promises will fail. Uh, And that is the fundamental spiritual truth that lies behind the persecution and anti-Semitism faced by the Jewish people for thousands of years even through to this last century with, of course, the Holocaust, and even through to the present day, which is in our news right now every single day, Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, under the auspices of Iran, seeking to wipe Israel off the map. Why are they doing it? Uh, They hate Israel, but why ultimately? It's Satan behind the scenes trying to destroy the nation of Israel to ultimately thwart, thwart the purposes and plans of God. Uh, Pastor Gary Hamrick, who was with us uh, a little while ago, um, uh, made a very clear statement, which I think is a very accurate statement, uh, about anti-Semitism, that ultimately, fundamentally, anti-Semitism is Satanism, because it is a manifestation of Satan's opposition to the purposes of God being worked out through the nation of Israel. And so that brings us to verse 6, where we left off. Uh, last uh, week. And this brings us right into the middle period of this seven-year tribulation that will come upon the earth immediately prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, Take a look at verse 6. Then the woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Uh, And so here we are, 1,260 days. Now, uh, that time frame should be familiar to you if you've been studying through uh, the book of Revelation. 1,260 days is the equivalent of 42 months, which is the equivalent of three and one-half years. Uh, One half of the seven-year tribulation period. And the particular half of the seven-year tribulation period in view here is the second half of the tribulation immediately prior to the return of Jesus. And so the first five verses of Revelation uh, chapter 12 uh, have given us the broad spiritual context for what is now going to be talked about as happening during the tribulation at this particular time. There is a spiritual battle raging. Satan is opposing the purposes of God. He's opposing the people of God. He's specifically coming against uh, the Jewish people, the nation of uh, Israel. Uh, And this makes the point clearly that what we are reading now is taking place at the end of the tribulation period is not just some kind of historical anomaly, Uh, But it is, in fact, both a continuation and a culmination of Satan's attempts to destroy God working out his purposes through the nation of Israel. And thus for Satan to preserve his own life, to stop him himself from being destroyed, and ultimately to try and accomplish his own purpose of conquering God and ruling the universe himself. And so, verse 6 then tells us that at the middle of of this uh, seven-year tribulation period, Israel flees to the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Now, we'll talk about that in more detail in just a second, but just to notice, this language, Israel fleeing to the wilderness, 
to a place prepared by God where she's uh, provided for by God uh, would be very familiar language to any Jewish person because this is the language of the Exodus. If you go back to the book of Exodus, this is exactly what happened. Uh, Israel had an enemy, Pharaoh, the Egyptians, uh, and they, the Lord took them. They fled out of Egypt into the wilderness. Uh, in the wilderness, God took them to a place he prepared down in Mount Sinai and ultimately in the promised land. But while they were in the wilderness, God provided for and sustained them. Uh, and so this is the language of the Exodus, very familiar language to any Jewish person. But of course, this is not talking about the Exodus that happened, um, you know, 3,000 years ago. Uh, this is talking about what we might refer to as a second exodus uh, that will take place at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation uh, period. So the question then is, well, why does Israel need to flee at this point? Uh, and that is what is explained for us from verses 7 down through to verse uh, 17. And so let us just read the text now, picking it up in verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, and he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a, flood over the, uh, uh, like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which uh, the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ." Father in heaven, we ask for the help of your Holy Spirit this morning to help us to, to understand the truth of your word. Uh, we thank you for your word that is living and powerful, uh, and we pray your blessing upon your word to each of our hearts today, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in answer to the question, why is the woman, Israel, fleeing into the wilderness at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation, we have described for us um, two reasons in these verses. In verses 7 through 9, we see the spiritual reason, the spiritual realm. A war breaks out in heaven, instigated by Satan. As a result of that, Satan is defeated and is cast down to earth. And Satan institutes a war on earth, particularly coming after the Jewish people. And it is because of those two things that the Jewish people flee to the mountains. Now, we'll unpack this now as we go through, starting with Satan's war in heaven. Take a look again at verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. 
So we're introduced here to uh, Michael the Archangel and a war that he wages against the dragon who we've already identified as Satan. So these are the combatants, as it were, in this war that breaks out in heaven. Michael the archangel and, and his army of angels, and the dragon Satan and his army of angels. Now, Michael the archangel uh, appears in the scriptures by name on four separate occasions. He is one of two angels in the Bible that we know by name. The other angel we know by name, of course, being the angel Gabriel, who interestingly also appears by name in the scriptures four times. Now, whereas Gabriel is always seen delivering a message from God, we see him in Daniel chapter 8. We see Gabriel in Daniel chapter 9. The prophecy of the 70 weeks was given to Daniel uh, by the angel Gabriel. We see Gabriel announcing uh, that uh, Zachariah's wife Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1. And also Gabriel brought the message to Mary that she was pregnant with Jesus the Messiah. Uh, Gabriel is always kind of bringing messages. messages. He's sort of like a, a messenger angel. Uh, Michael, on the other hand, we see is fighting battles. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10, a fascinating passage, Daniel prays. Uh, and he's waiting several weeks for the answer to his prayer. And eventually Michael turns up and he says, well, you know what? I would have been here sooner, but th there was a spiritual enemy that was fighting me, trying to stop me from getting here. So it took me three weeks to defeat him. And now I'm here. Uh, and it, a fascinating insight into the spiritual realm. That Daniel prayed... The moment he prayed, God answered that prayer and dispatched Michael, the angel, the archangel, to bring the answer. But it took three weeks for Michael to get there. Why? Because there was a spiritual battle going on. Let's think about that for a moment and think about any prayers that you've prayed to God that you haven't received an answer yet. That's a very interesting insight. It may well be that God has already answered your prayer. You haven't received it yet. Because there's a spiritual battle going on. Because Satan does not want that to happen. And so I would encourage you. Use your spiritual weapons to fight the spiritual battle. And chief among our spiritual weapons is the weapon of prayer. Engage in that spiritual warfare. And pray, pray, pray. But we also see Michael... In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, and this is particularly interesting to us, and I do have the verse on the screen there. In Daniel 12 verse 1, at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen uh, since there was a nation even to that time. Now, a couple of interesting Points there, Daniel 12, verse 1, Daniel writing sort of 500 years before Jesus was born. Uh, firstly, we're told Michael is a great prince who stands watch over the people of Israel. So it seems that Michael the archangel has a specific uh, mission from God to fight spiritual battles on behalf of the nation of Israel. The second interesting thing to note about Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, is it is talking specifically about the same thing that we are reading about in Revelation chapter 12. It is talking about the tribulation that will come upon this earth immediately prior to the second coming of Christ. Daniel was prophesied to be involved, standing up for the nation of Israel at that time. And here in Revelation 12, we see exactly the same thing. And so, Michael the archangel, and he's fighting here then in Revelation 12 against Satan, the dragon. Now, this verse actually is very helpful for us uh, in correcting what is a common misunderstanding about Satan. Uh, often people think of Satan as being the opposite of God. 
that we have God who is obviously good and holy and righteous, and we have Satan, you know, who is evil and unholy and unrighteous. And, of course, that is true. But what we must remember and what we must always remember is while Satan is the opposite to God in some ways, he is not the equal of God in any way because Satan is a created being. God is the creator. Satan is a created being. In fact, Satan is an angel who fell in heaven. Now, if you want to dig into all of that, you can look back in Ezekiel uh, chapter 28. You can look at Isaiah uh, chapter 14, and you will read about this angel who was called Lucifer, son of the morning, um, who is pictured in this glorious manner uh, until iniquity was found in his heart, and he led a rebellion against God in heaven. And um, as we saw last week in Revelation 12, uh, apparently took a third of the angels uh, with him. But Satan is not the opposite of God. If there is an opposite to be made, then Michael the archangel is, is a much better uh, comparison. Um, Satan is sort of on the equal level of Michael the archangel in the sense that they are both created angels. So don't think of Satan as the opposite of God. Better to think of him as the opposite of Michael uh, the archangel. Um, and so, but, but notice down in verse 9... Uh, we are given several names of Satan. He's referred to in verse 9 as the great dragon, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Uh, the great dragon, that's a symbol of his viciousness and his desire to devour um, his prey. The serpent of old, of course, is a reference back to the Garden of Eden uh, when uh, Satan came into the Garden of Eden as a serpent and deceived Eve, his deception. The word devil, the Greek word diabolos, it means accuser. Satan, the word means adversary. He opposes God, indeed opposes the people of God and the purposes of God. Uh, and so we have this picture of, of Satan but in order to help us understand what's kind of transpiring in these verses, it might be helpful for us to understand a little bit about what is commonly referred to as the abodes of Satan or the dwelling places of Satan. Because Satan is described in the Bible as having a number of different uh, dwelling places. Uh, in this present day, we might refer to Satan's dwelling place as the atmospheric heavens to coin Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Now, this comes from two verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, which says on the screen, Ephesians 2, verse 2, um, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air. Reference to Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So Satan is referred to there as the prince of the power of the air. So there's sort of like a dwelling place in the air, if you will. Um, Ephesians 6.12, we read this verse uh, earlier. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Again, so, so we have this sense of the dwelling place uh, of Satan that exists, of course, in the spiritual realm, somewhere, we might say, between earth and the dwelling place of God. And so Satan then, in his dwelling in this sort of atmospheric heavens, we might say, has access to heaven, the dwelling place of God, and he also has access to earth. In Job uh, chapter 1, of course, famously, we see Satan uh, going uh, before the throne of God to talk to God to make an accusation against Job and basically say, oh, well, Job only serves you, you know, because, you know, his life's good and everything's easy and he's got everything he wants. But I bet you if you took all of that away that he'd curse you. Okay, Satan accusing uh, Job before God. Uh, so Satan has access 
uh, to the throne of God for the purpose of accusing the brethren. And indeed, that's what he's referred to um, uh, here in our passage as the accuser of the brethren. Uh, but he also has access to this earth, of course. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5, we're told that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Uh, but interestingly, we're also told in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. In other words, uh, Satan doesn't uh, present himself as, you know, some big evil person with a pitchfork and horns and, you know, looking like that. But Satan is much cleverer than that. Uh, Satan transforms himself and pretends that he's good. Pretends that what he says is true. And as such, as we read in verse 9 here in Revelation chapter 12, he deceives the whole world. Satan is a deceiver. His purpose before God is to accuse the brethren. His purpose in the world is to deceive the world ultimately to prevent people from coming to save in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil is an expert in lies. He's an expert in deception. And you only need to look around the world today to see that that is the case. Think of the religions of the world. Whether it be Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. Whether it's the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or Confucianism. The list could go on. The one thing that all of those religions have in common is they all reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. They all have an appearance of good to the people who follow them. They all have an appearance of truth. And we're living in a very sort of ecumenical age in which people are looking for, for the good in everything. And we think, oh, all of these things are good. And, you know, you're a person of faith. doesn't really matter what that faith is, but that's good. You see, these are the lies of the devil. This is Satan transforming himself into an angel of light in order to deceive people away from the truth uh, so that they cannot be saved. And so the religions of the world, the philosophies of the world, the spirit of this age, we see it all around us. Uh, it manifests itself in so many different ways, but all have in common a rejection uh, of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, and this is the deception of Satan at work in this world. Now, this deception of Satan will reach its peak uh, in the tribulation period, uh, where as the Antichrist rises up, uh, and as the false prophet rises up, a political uh, leader, a religious leader, will combine to deceive uh, the whole world. And that's what we read about in Revelation chapter 13. So we have to wait till next time till we get there. Uh, but Satan, uh, just to sort of tie it up here, we'll notice Satan is defeated in this battle and he is cast down to earth. And if you read then, then in verse 8, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Uh, and so Satan is cast down to earth he is not allowed access now to the throne of God anymore at this point in the middle of the tribulation. He cannot accuse the brethren before God anymore, uh, according to verse 10. Uh, so his access to heaven is revoked at this point. But significantly for the narrative, he is then cast down to earth. Cast down to earth. And if you drop down to verse 12... In the middle of verse 12, we read, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. And so, here's the picture. The devil wages war in heaven. Maybe this was an attempt to get at the Messiah and stop him from coming. We're not told. Maybe it was something to do with the nation of Israel. We're not told specifically. But he was defeated by Michael, Michael the archangel, and he was cast down to earth. 
and he comes down to earth with great wrath and great fury, and now we see he's going to turn that wrath and fury on the world in general, when we get to chapter 13, but on the people of Israel in particular. And that's what we see beginning then in verse 13. But before we read that, I just want to give you a little preview, uh, because um, Satan won't be on earth very long as his exclusive abode. Uh, just three and a half years, and that'll be it. His time is short. Um, when we get to Revelation 20, he's going to be cast into the bottomless pit, where he's going to be bound for a thousand years. You're not going to be doing much while he's bound for a thousand years. Uh, and then ultimately, at the end of Revelation chapter 20, he's going to end up in the lake of fire, which is going to be his eternal dwelling place. And, um, and he will be done. Uh, and his work will be ultimately no more. So that's where Satan is headed. Okay? But back to the text, verse 13. This is where we tie it all uh, together. Uh, remember we read in verse 6 that the woman fled into the wilderness uh, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Well, that sort of summarizes now what is about to follow. Satan cast down to earth with great wrath and now he turns it upon uh, the people of Israel in particular. Verse 13. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the male child, the Messiah. So this is what is happening. This is why the woman flees. Israel flees. It is because Satan is cast down to earth and through the person of the Antichrist and the false prophet instigates this great persecution of the Jewish people. And this kind of knocks us back into the bigger picture of the chronology of uh, the book of Revelation. You remember back in chapter 11, uh, we had the two witnesses in the first half of the tribulation who were there in Jerusalem, and they were uh, preaching the gospel for that first three and a half years of the uh, tribulation. During that time, those two witnesses were protected by God. Uh, their preaching of the judgment to come uh, and indeed salvation in Christ uh, was seen as a, as a torment by the people, and, uh, but they couldn't touch them because they were protected by God until God's purpose for them was done, and then a beast arose out of the abyss, the manifestation of the person of the Antichrist, who in chapter 11 we saw rose up and was able to kill the two witnesses. And the world marveled at this, this individual who was able to do what nobody else had been able to do in killing these two witnesses and thus paves the way for the Antichrist to rise to sole world power in the middle of the tribulation. Of course, a preview of what was to come was found in Revelation chapter 11 because the two witnesses, they were dead for three and a half days and then God raised them from the dead and ascended them into heaven. Uh, but this clears the way for the rise of the Antichrist to sole world power. And what we see here in chapter 13, the dragon, Satan, through the person of the Antichrist, we talk about him in chapter 13, now persecutes the nation of Israel. Now this ties together a whole bunch of scriptures that I want to share with you. And firstly, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 We've read this verse a number of times in our studies in the book of Revelation, but this speaks of the time of this seven-year period of tribulation immediately prior to the return of Christ. The he is the Antichrist. The Antichrist shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That is seven years, a period of seven. But in the middle of the week, which is right where we are now, Revelation 12, right? In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering in the temple, which will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And in the middle of the week, on the wing of abomination, shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. And so in the middle of this tribulation period, right where we are in Revelation 12, verse 13, the Antichrist will rise up, will bring an end to the sacrifices and offerings in the temple of Jerusalem, and will commit what Daniel refers to as the abomination which brings about desolation. Now, what is that exactly? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 answers the question for us. Speaking of the man of sin, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, 
the Antichrist. He is the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see, this is what the Antichrist will do. Uh, He will go into the temple of God, declare himself to be God, demand to be worshipped as God, and with the aid of the false prophet we'll see in chapter 13, he will subsequently erect an image uh, of the beast uh, in the holy place of the temple. Uh, The abomination of desolation will be committed. Satan, uh, through the person of the Antichrist, uh, will be in power over the whole world um, through the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, And this, then, is what begins this persecution against the Jewish people, in particular, beginning in Jerusalem. And this is what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 15. When Jesus, again talking about this same period of time, said, Therefore, and this is speaking to the Jewish people, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, right? That's Daniel 9, 27. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Right? That's where we are in Revelation 12. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Right? This, this is going to be urgent. This is going to be severe. Okay, so it's a get going. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, because both of those things will hinder uh, the flight. And the emphasis here is that the urgency uh, of the fleeing because of the seriousness of the persecution which he says in verse 21 for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be jesus there is quoting daniel chapter 12 verse 1 that we read earlier and so there's this great urgency as a result of the persecution of the antichrist that is poured out upon the world in general, we'll see in chapter 13, but on the Jewish people in particular, here in chapter 12. So notice what happens, verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So Satan, through the Antichrist, unleashes great persecution on the people of Israel, but God supernaturally protects the people of Israel by enabling them to flee to a safe place. Interestingly, the two wings of a great eagle is exactly the same language that is used of the Exodus back in the book of Exodus, that God brought out the children of Israel out of Egypt on on the wings of the eagle. And so the, the language is that God is delivering Uh, his people from the hands of his enemies, uh, supernaturally, as he did through the Red Sea in um, the book of Exodus, so he will do at this time for the people of Israel, to a place that God has already prepared, and in that place, uh, God will nourish them, provide for them supernaturally for a times, time, times, and half a time, which is one plus two plus half, which is three and a half, which is three and a half years, 1,260 days, 42 months. We get the time scale. And so, God supernaturally protects them. What happens then, verse 15? So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And so again, Satan is relentless in his attacks. This flood um, is kind of the language of an invasion, And symbolically, this is sort of a picture of Satan, the Antichrist, sending his armies after the people of Israel as they flee uh, to the mountains, to the wilderness. Uh, But the earth swallows it up. God supernaturally protects the nation of Israel from the attacks of Satan. And then verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so, Satan fails in his attempt to destroy Israel. He goes after 
the rest of her offspring, which is an interesting reference. Some people think that's a reference to the 144,000 who, uh, who are, are witnessing uh, throughout this period of time, and so, so would not be among those who uh, flee. Others think that the rest of her offspring is talking about Gentile believers who've got saved through the Jewish Messiah, and uh, that may well be the case as well. But the point of the passage is God's supernatural protection upon the nation of Israel at this point. Now, as we close, I just want to take you back to verse 10. Because in the middle of all of this, we read, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. And so in the midst of all this attack of Satan on the earth, there is a declaration of victory in heaven. And there is a call to rejoice in heaven. Why? Because Christ has the victory over Satan. And even those who suffer under the persecution of Satan, and even those who will be martyred uh, for their faith in Jesus Christ during this time, and we'll get more into that in chapter 13, they will overcome Satan because they are covered by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And here we have a snapshot of the gospel. Satan, uh, the accuser of the brethren, uh, he goes into the presence of God and says, oh, so-and-so, they don't really love you. Did you see what they did? Did you see, they, did you see what they said? You know? And Satan accuses us of what? Accuses us of being a sinner. And you know what? I am a sinner. Satan, you're right. You're right. I am a sinner. But you know what? I have a savior. And according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, when Satan accuses us against God, we have an advocate. We have a defense lawyer, as it were. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so we stand before God, not guilty in our sin, even though we're guilty in and of ourselves, but we stand before God righteous because we stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. The blood of the lamb cleanses us from all of our sins. And how do we avail ourselves of that cleansing, of that forgiveness for sins? Well, it's by grace that we have been saved through faith. Because Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so in the midst of all the evils of Satan, we as believers in Jesus Christ, even today, have great cause for rejoicing because we are on the winning side. Jesus Christ has gained the victory. He conquered sin and death through his death and resurrection, and he is coming back to finally conquer Satan once and for all to establish his kingdom of righteousness on this earth, and that is where we are heading as we move through the book of Revelation. But we have to stop it there for now. Chapter 13 will be next time, but that'll be in two weeks because we've got a guest speaker next week. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us uh, today. We pray your blessing uh, upon your word to our hearts as we give you thanks. And indeed, as we rejoice in the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and who is our Savior. We give you praise, honor, and glory this day. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. We'll sing a closing song.